Hello and um, welcome to the Raisana Ideas Pod. Thank you for joining us. And I'm here with the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sweden, uh, Tobias Bilstrom. And thank you, Minister, for coming uh, to join us at the Raisana Dialogue this year. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on a number of issues. But I'd like to start with Sweden's position currently in its presidency of Europe, um, which is, of course, a rotating position, but one that you take on um, in Sweden at a very crucial point in uh, Europe's relations with its neighborhood, but also with the wider world. Um, short while ago, the European Union came up with an Indo-Pacific strategy, and there is, in some ways, the most um, telling growth in relationships over the next uh, de couple of decades, maybe between the European continent and the broader Indo-Pacific region. Um, how do you feel um, the Swedish presidency can contribute to this dynamic, and what is your view of this relationship going forward? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here to, to the ORF board, and uh, I would like to start by stating, I think, the obvious, namely that the Indo-Pacific region counts for 60% of the world's uh, GDP overall. And I think that's in, in itself is in, in a good enough reason for the European Union to be engaged. But there is, of course, more to it. It's the fact that this region harbors a very substantial amount of the world's population. It is, if we look at India as a, a specific country, it is also the no most dense, uh, you largest know, country, uh, lar largest country in po population. And I think that we need in the EU to uh, step up and become more interested in the Indo-Pacific region. We need to talk more about trade, we need to talk more about green transition, climate change. We also should talk more about supply chains, uh, something which has, during the COVID period, become you know, increasingly more interesting for, for many parties around the world. And also, of course, security uh, matters, which is also important. And we should do this in a dialogue with the countries of the Indo-Pacific. And for our part, as presidency of the European Union, we believe that we should start organizing things in a better way when it comes to this dialogue and uh, do it in a more frequent manner. We shouldn't just sit down when there is a crisis. We should do it on a you know, mutual basis. And I think that uh, you're quite right. That is, uh, the sustained dialogue is one way to get better understanding if a crisis does emerge. Um, one such crisis uh, we have been faced with, of course, uh, globally over the past uh, um, few years, uh, past year now, and that has been the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, from us, uh, uh, for us in India, what we did note was that um, the effect on Sweden was great, that it changed the 200-year uh, policy of neutrality. Um, but it is also true that many of our other partners in the Global South um, do not necessarily see the Ukrainian invasion as so much different very different from some other invasions in the past 20 or 30 years. Um, is there a way that you would want to change their mind? Is there something that you would want to tell us about how this is an unusual and particularly dangerous event from the point of view of sovereignty? Yes, definitely. I would like to start by saying that this is a conflict which concerns all on this globe. Because what's happening now with the Russia's illegal aggression and war against Ukraine is that we are faced with a, a, a challenge towards the UN Charter about the very fundamentals, rules, which guide us through this, this world, and which, which states very clearly that larger states do not have a right to encroach upon smaller states. They do not have a right to tell other states that you won't be allowed to, to have territorial integrity or to have sovereignty. You are a part of our sphere of interest, and here we dictate the, 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 uh, the uh, conditions. And, you know, looking to, towards this region, I think, especially with relation to China, there are reasons to be worried about what would happen if Russia were to succeed in Ukraine because that would also herald to many states around the world who are authoritarian that, you know, might is right, mm. and might is certainly not right. Going back then to Sweden and also to our neighbor Finland, um, the 24th of February 2022 was certainly a very important date in world history with the invasion of Ukraine being launched by Russia. But the 17th of December 2021, the year before, was also an important date for Sweden and Finland. This was the date when Russia launched a letter saying that, in essence, uh, that Sweden and Finland would never be allowed to join NATO, that we were also part of their sphere of interest, and that we were to be guided what they thought was you know, uh, uh, the dictate of, of Moscow. 
This was what started the process that led to the NATO application of Sweden and Finland. The understanding by us, by the governments of Sweden and Finland, and also by the populations, we should understand that in Sweden, NATO accession has a support of 77% of the population, and in Finland it's 90%. This is because we know, with the closeness in, in geography towards Russia, that unless we improve our security situation by joining NATO, what is happening now in Ukraine might very well happen to us as well. Rus Russia shows that there is no limits to the use of military force in order to achieve political, political goals. So again, this is why we are joining NATO, because we feel that it is the only way forward. But it's interesting that you say that um, essentially what, what you believe has been demonstrated over the past year is that um, one of the largest and most powerful armies in, uh, countries in the world has determined that it can use its army to redraw maps. And you think that this is what is fundamentally different between this invasion and things that have, heard, uh, have happened elsewhere. Um, in your sense, and over the next... Uh, uh, a few months as you carry on your presidency, how would you think that the rest of the European Union, um, both in, in Brussels and uh, the other member states, what advice would you give them in terms of their outreach to the global south, to places where maybe this powerful argument is not heard effectively? I think that we have to be a bit humble from the European Union. We have to understand that the narrative which is being pumped out by Moscow is about uh, colonialization, uh, that, that the war in Ukraine is, uh, is the West, uh, you know, underpinning a, a, a state, uh, underpinning Ukraine in relation to Russia. The matter of fact is that it is actually, actually the opposite. It is Russia that is the colonial power. It is Russia that is trying to rebuild a, an, an empire. And sitting here in, in Delhi, in a country that used to be part of an empire, I think that many of the people in this country know exactly what I'm talking about as Foreign Minister of Sweden. The time of empire building should have ceased after 1945. This is the moment in time where the UN Charter is established, albeit it's a few years later in 47, but after the Second World War, the world... Uh, was brought to its senses. There was a common understanding that we need to move into a new era. But again, I think we should be, we should be a bit humble about this. We should understand that we, I resent a bit to use the word global, or the, the term the global south, because I think it encompasses, you know, a, a mass of countries. And which also are, compared to Sweden, everywhere is the global south. Exactly, you know, from a geographical <laughs> point of view, certainly. But it is, also, it is also a question of lumping a number of countries together under, under, under the same, same, same uh, uh, etiquette. And I think we should perhaps use it in, in a different way. But setting that aside, yes, there is a number of countries which we have to reach out to and a number of people which we have to talk to. And I think the best way of countering this narrative is, as I said, to point to the obvious fact. This is a colonial war being brought forward by Russia, by Moscow. And we have to counter this because all of us in the world who do not enjoy and who do not like empire building, who actually believe in the sovereignty of states, who also can see that the Russian war has brought about famine, it has brought about a decline in global economy. It has brought about deteriorating conditions for a number of people who were already living in dire, under dire circumstances. All this could have been avoided by not using military power to achieve political goals, as Russia has done in Ukraine. But we have to talk with people. We have to talk with the governments of, of countries like India, but also other, other places, and together join hand in hand to counter this, this development of, as I said, the idea that uh, might is right and that empire building is, is here again. Thank you, Minister. We're running um, towards the end of this interview now, so I'll ask a final question maybe on um, how Sweden and India themselves have partnered going forward. Uh, in the past, we have had many positive and successful relationships uh, structured around uh, sustainable development, around modernization, uh, shared technology for development. Um, but um, maybe in the future, we were wondering what are the new domains into which this collaboration is likely to go? Um, what, are the, what do you have in mind yourself for collaboration between India and Sweden, and maybe India and the Nordic countries in general? 
thank you very much. I have a long list of <laughs> items <laughs> because I feel that uh, India and Sweden are so very close in minds. And we have had diplomatic relations for, you know, 75 years. We have been here ever since India was, was uh, you know, declared its independence. We have companies, 260 of them, many of them who have been here for 100 years. We have been here for, as they say, the long haul. Uh, and we intend to, to remain here because we can see that there is so much cooperation going on with Indian IT engineers going to Sweden, with Swedish companies being present here in, 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 the, in India, and we would like to expand that. Uh, we would see more uh, along the lines that the Indian government itself has declared, you know, make in India Swedish companies manufacturing goods and services on Indian soil. And this is the way forward as we see it. But there is also more to it than that. We can see strategic uh, cooperation taking place. We have large deposits of uh, uh, rare, uh, you know, earth metals that has been found in the north of Sweden, which could be put Graphics into good use. including them. Exactly, exactly. There is room for a lot of cooperation on that lines as well. As I said before, supply chains is, is becoming increasingly more important. So I'm here to have to start this dialogue on behalf of a new government. I've already had a, a very good bilateral together with your foreign minister, and I see plenty of room for cooperation on such various item, uh, things on the agenda, such as climate change, green transition, and as I said before, manufacture, and also I think there's uh, a room perhaps even for defense cooperation. Who knows? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you for joining us at the Raithana Idea Pods and at the Dialogue, and we hope to see you again here in India often.